Hey friends, welcome back to another Midweek Refill. I'm your host, Bishop A. Reginald Littman, Senior Pastor of the New Mountaintop Church. I'm inviting you to join us every single Sunday at 9.30 a.m. for our live service. Wherever you may be watching me in the world right now, you can always join us at 9.30 a.m. To check us out for our live worship experience or catch the replay, be sure you leave in the comments where you are viewing from. Well, it's always exciting to be with you, and thank you so much for your interest in these teachings. Well, in this episode, I'm going to be teaching on seven habits of a godly life. Seven habits of godly life. And I want you to make sure that you like, share, subscribe, leave a comment. Because all of those activities helps to push us out in the very crowded algorithms of Facebook and YouTube. So again, I'm excited to have you here and make sure you let someone else know that they also need to tune in to hear this week's teaching. So why don't we jump in now, talking about the seven habits of a godly life. And here's number one, prayer. Of course, that should come as no surprise at all. Because prayer is definitely, as I like to say, an acronym, P-R-A-Y-E-R. It's power released at your earliest request. You know, when you go to the ATM machine, if you've made deposits, then it is easy for you to make withdrawals. Prayer operates the very same way. That the more we deposit in terms of time with God, in terms of talking with God, living for God, and all of those types of things, the more we can pull out when it's time for us to make a withdrawal from the bank of heaven. So why is prayer important as we talk about seven habits of a godly life? Well, very simply, prayer is important because it is the thing that we use, if you will, to build a relationship with God as we seek his guidance. Prayer, ladies and gentlemen, is an invitation to God to come into our every situation. And it is also an exchange where we are sharing our heart with God. Then through the vehicle of prayer, God shares his heart and his help and his hand with us. And so prayer is essential for building a relationship with God and seeking his guidance. There's nothing in the world like the power of prayer to really tap in to the guidance of God through the help and aid of the Holy Spirit. Well, what does the scriptures have to say about the role of prayer and how we should pray and how significant prayer really is? Well, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 17, here's what Paul said. He instructs us there, Pray without ceasing. You think that's important? I do too. For Paul to say that we should pray without ceasing is indicative of the significance of prayer. Prayer, ladies and gentlemen, is God's way of connecting and communicating with us and our way of connecting and communicating with him. Therefore, Paul says, hey, listen, don't ever stop praying. Never cease to pray. Pray without ceasing. In fact, I want to challenge you to go back and read verse 16, 17, and 18 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It is amazing. Small passage of scripture that really helps us to lock in on where our mind should be as believers. But what else does Paul have to say regarding the significance of prayer? Well, over in the book of Philippians, which is four little chapters that Paul wrote while imprisoned, he says some amazing things concerning prayer. Let's look at it. For in Philippians chapter number four, verse number six and seven of Philippians chapter four, Paul wrote these words, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, 
which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, this verse, this passage is just chock full of so much beneficial material that we need to know as believers. But because here in Philippians chapter four, Paul is in jail. He's not at some banquet celebrating his his humanity or his spirituality. He's in prison. He's unsure of his outcome. And yet he writes these peaceful words to the church at Philippi. And he says, hey, do not be anxious. Now, it's in second person singular, which does not mean I should not be anxious, but you, hey, you, do not be anxious. The word anxious has to do with worry. The root word of it actually is to choke. When we worry, we literally put our hands around our throat and we cause an end to our breath coming out with words of praise to God. Also, we prevent ourselves from receiving what comes out of the mouth of God. So our language is off, our thinking is off, our spiritual equilibrium is off when we are filled with anxiety, which is why Paul says, from a prison cell, mind you, uncertain of his own outcome, hey, you, do not be anxious. Hey, let me know in the comments, is this speaking to you right now? Are you dealing with anxiety? Are you dealing with some form of worry? How's this speaking to you right now? This is what Paul says. Here's how you handle life in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving that your requests be made known to God. And I'll come back at another time to really break that all the way down. And notice what happens when you inform God and stop worrying about everything. He says, you can let your requests be made known unto God. It's hard to complain and request in faith at the same time. But watch what happens when you let go of your anxiety and when you hold on to your worship rather than your worry, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. What will it do? It will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. What a beautiful illustration that is. I look forward to preaching that soon. That just speaks to me. And when I let go of my worry and I hold on to my worship, God sends his peace to guard my heart and to guard my mind. So understanding this is so very, very powerful because we learn that if we are to please God and if we are indeed to practice habits that are godly, that represent a godly life, then we must pray, but we must pray in faith and we must trust God and we must not worry. All right. So here's number two, Bible study. Bible study is another highly effective habit of a godly life. Now, why does Bible study matter? Scriptural memorization, reading through the words of the text. It matters for so many reasons. But when we regularly study our Bible, it helps us to really understand God's will and God's plan for our lives. I love the word of God because it is God's will and it is God's word. And we can be found in his word and discover his will if we will regularly study our Bible. So I want to ask you a question. How would you rate yourself from January 1 up to this point, whenever you're watching this video, January 1 up to this point, how have you been doing in terms of really digging into your Bible? Now, I'm not talking about when you go to church on Sunday, if you still go to church. A lot of people don't go to church on Sunday. For a lot of people, this right here is church. And, and that's cool. You know, no judgment here. However you receive just make sure that you're checking in with God and that you're you're filling your spirit and your soul with his word. 
But how have you been doing in terms of regular study of your Bible? Not waiting on your pastor, your rabbi, your priest, your whatever, your favorite tele, favorite televangelist to tell you to turn to a scripture, but you personally, how are you doing with that? Well, what should we do? What should be our habit in terms of studying the word of God? Paul answers that question in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 16 and verse 17. This, by the way, is a letter to his spiritual son, Timothy. Listen to what he says. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul wanted Timothy to understand the significance of Scripture, knowing what God's Word said, and to value it highly because he wanted him to understand as he was launching him into ministry as a spiritual son, and though he did not have us in mind, there is sort of a vicarious message even to us today as modern day Christians, and that is that we should esteem the word of God as being beneficial for our learning and teaching others, being taught of the scriptures that we may in turn teach others. And then reproof, correction, training in righteousness. And here's the result of stand in the scripture is this, that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's why we have to stay in the word of God and stay in it on a daily basis. It's absolutely essential to our spiritual well-being. And here's number three. Number three is obedience. Obedience to God in every simple way. Now, why is obedience a necessity as a believer? I'm glad you asked that question. You see, obedience to God's command demonstrates our love for him, and it helps us literally to grow in our faith. There's so many scriptures and stories that are replete with how people obeyed God and how God blessed them beyond their wildest dreams. When you obey God, you set your life in position to receive everything that God wants to send down from heaven. It's in the obedience of your heart. And obeying every command that God gives and God has spoken in his word is a demonstration of how much you really love him. And it's your love for God shown through your obedience that helps each and every one of us to continuously grow in our faith. I'm reminded of the story in Genesis 22 of Abraham when God had told him to take his son Isaac, the only one God recognized, up Mount Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. Abraham got up early the next morning, got his donkeys ready, got his helpers ready, got the wood, the fire, the knife, and all of that, and traveled until God says, this is the place that I have commanded you to sacrifice. And without reservation, he lays Isaac on the altar. He lights the fire. He's ready to do what God said. The moment he puts the knife up in the air in obedience to God, that's the moment God steps in. God expands his faith beyond his dreams and says to him through the angel, now I know that I've got first place in your life. You know, Isaac had already asked him, dad, I see the wood. I see the, the, you know, the knife. I see the fire, but where's the sacrifice? And listen to what he said to him. Son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. Now he did not go up the mountain knowing the outcome. But before he went up the mountain, go and check it out in Genesis 22. He says to his servants, you all stay here. We will go up and worship. And after we have done so, we will return back to you. So when you go through 
trial and test after test, in obedience to God, following his commands, it demonstrates your love for God. But your obedience also causes your faith to grow exponentially so that the next time God challenges you with a test, you're ready and you're equipped with even more faith to go through that test. Now, the Bible says in John 14 and 15, Jesus speaks these words, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You see, a sign of our love for Christ is to do whatever he tells us to do. Now, let me just caution you. He's not going to tell you to go and offer up your child. That's not a uh, principle that I want you to walk away with. But whatever he says to do, trust him through it. Let him walk you through it. And he says the true sign of our love for him is what we're really willing to do for him, keeping his commandments. So how much do you really love the Lord? Or better still, this year, how would you rate yourself from one to 10 in terms of your obedience to God? And I want you to leave your number in the, in the, uh, in the comment section between one and 10. How would you rate your obedience to God thus far this year? With one being, I'm not being t- obedient at all, and 10 being, I'm knocking it out of the park. Leave a number in the comments. I'm really curious to see what your responses will be. Hey, I'll tell you what. I'm going to finish this up next week, and we'll pick up with number four through number seven. Before I go, though, I do want you to to like, share, subscribe. Make sure you leave a comment. Also, you can find a free PDF study guide that will help you to really personalize this teaching. Uh, It goes a little bit further than I've had time to go in this particular video. And it's got great discussion questions. It is absolutely free. You can print it out. You can share it. You can email it to a friend. Can't wait to share with you in the next episode. Until then, make sure you're obeying God and doing exactly what he says. I love you. Not a thing you can do about it. Catch me right here, 9.30 a.m. live every Sunday morning. God bless you.